Hey, it's Les from the TV Dudes. While at ATX Fest Season 7, I had the great opportunity to sit down with several of the people behind the Nat Geo show Genius. They're in their second season focusing on Pablo Picasso, and I got to chat with costume designer Sanu Mishra, as well as makeup and hair designer Davina Lamont. It was a great peek behind the curtain at how a very complicated, beautiful show is made, and I hope you enjoy. I've only gotten to watch a few episodes of, of Picasso so far, but I'm loving it, uh, particularly how well handled the time periods are, and how, knowing from other shows how easily that can get messy and go wrong. Um, were there particular concerns for the makeup and the costumes to, to make sure that you stayed delineated on those time periods when you go from Pablo Ruiz to, to Rich Picasso later? It was a very organic process because, uh, again, you know, we we mapped out the important timelines, which is like when he was a young artist, when he moves to he comes to Paris for the first time for the Universal Expo. Um, then when he lives in Battle of War, you know, so there was so and then when it's and so on as he moves on. As I was saying, he comes in. He starts out very simple, then he goes into this very fantastic. Um, important phase where he's rich and he has all the money to make wear these beautiful clothes and I'd read somewhere he was making his suits out in London, you know. Mm-hmm. And then towards the end of his life where he's such an established artist where he would, could run around in a pair of shorts mm-hmm. and meet the most important art buyer and art dealer and not worry about it. He could be bare he was in many of his pictures barefoot mm-hmm. with just a pair of shorts and chest out cigar in hand totally powerful because he that's where he was while when he went goes to the unit when he went to the universal expo in 1900 with his friends casa hamis he the two of them go went and got this suit made and they end up going there because they wanted to fit into this whole world of the artists and they tried to you know somehow blend into that and then yes so we mapped out the important phases and then it was very organic then we allowed the script to tell us the stories where what was important where this outfit could work and I had recreated um, a few key outfits throughout so we could see where he was at that moment and the rest was uh, you know it came through almost it was almost like creation you know we'd go in and we'd see we needed these 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 themes and you know where um and develop it as the scripts were developing. But we did mark out the key important moments, and then the clothes somehow started, you know, because it's not just Picasso, it's also all the people around mm-hmm. him. So, so we'd flip-flop, wouldn't we? We'd yes. flip-flop between, you know, one scene would start off well, in the 1900s, and then the very next scene would dive into the 1940s, and we'd keep flip-flopping, which is, you know, it, it's crazy to kind of, you know, be in that world, and you're kind of going, okay, so we need to... Uh, and it's com- obviously completely different. And so, therefore, we was... And it was nearly on a daily basis, we yes. flip-flop between each period. And um, and so, you know, even for me, although we would try and hit the timelines of, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, with our crowd in particular, for me in makeup and hair, and as well as prosthetics, uh, mine was the aging that we had to do. Yes. And so we have to constantly kind of look and see uh, when we could develop, you know, especially for Picasso, who went through a massive timeline, and where we could hit, hit each and every mark from when he went from the full comb over to then, uh, and it was never really said, you know, when did he actually start to shave the top of his hair off? And, and you know, the, the amount of work that me and Antonio both kind of looked into research, we were like, well, it's kind of around about this period. And mm-hmm. so as soon as we saw it in the script, then we knew that we could go into you know uh, you know the next week for him and we ended up having like four different weeks for Antonio alone and so the majority of the work for me not only did it all the different looks of the time periods but was basically aging and we aged up to we had 17 characters in prosthetics alone uh, you know throughout the whole show which was massive yeah the timeline for me his lifespan was really long. Almost a century, you yeah. were saying. 93 years. And, a, I mean, 
if someone had lived for a century, five centuries ago, maybe that century wouldn't have been the wildest yeah. change in, in imaginable, but he lived in a century that changed decade to decade. The Industrial Revolution. Yeah. I mean, he was born in Franco, Spain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From that, he goes into, you know, the high society, not as a visitor in Paris. Then he ends up living as, I love that phase where he lived in Batolovar with all the great artists, mm -hmm. the yet-to-be famous artists, Modigliani, poets Max Jacob, Apollinaire. Yeah. I mean, he was... And then, of course, we have an important moment of contrast as well because there's in one of the episodes, we see Matisse. And Matisse was an established artist, very well-known, very well-renowned. And we could see how Picasso would dress, for me, in costumes. Well, I love that Picasso made a choice to dress like a workman. He looked like a miner because he'd wear these, you know, overalls and trousers. And, you know, he did his appearance was very very ma masculine but also very, he didn't care much he had these trousers which I recreated with big patches in the front and this, the, the, the work jacket and while Matisse Matisse dressed like a British gentleman you know he had these tweed suits on golden glasses the smock was perfectly made in linen and so Matisse would take they say he would take the ugliness and transform it into beauty while Picasso would take the beauty and transform it because I think there was again how do you see art the whole thing about Picasso and our show is how do, how do we see the world we see it differently every person looks at life differently and that's what's fascinating about them looking at the world through an artist's mind well, it was also in the scripts wasn't it when um, when you know Picasso as a young boy all of his teachers in the art world were trying to get him to paint you know pictures of the background and pictures of vistas mm -hmm. and he kept trying to change so it's kind of it's, it was a great kind of element that uh, that they wrote into the script and um, to kind of go you can be anything you want and, and, and to know that in the 1900s they were trying to change the world yeah. and it's, it's cool today and it, growing up in a period of time coming off of uh, the patronage system of art and when he says in the first or second episode to his father I, I want to be famous for painting what I want to paint and right. th that is absolutely absurd to say Back uh, then, you'll yeah. be paid to paint what the church would like you to paint or what your patrons yes. would like you to paint. It just reminded me of Caravaggio because Caravaggio is a painter from mm -hmm. Renaissance and again he was one of the feisty ones and you know he created the chiaroscuro mm -hmm. and the dark and the light and again he was always against the system and he mm -hmm. painted what he wanted. 500 la years later people still travel to Italy to go and to look go. at a Caravaggio. Yes. You know you like him you don't like him. Caravaggio killed a man over so a got, tennis. Died on a beach out of prison. Yeah. 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 And he ran I mean, he was a feisty guy, mm -hmm. but he painted what he wanted. This is what I'm saying, is that sometimes there is a power behind these artists. You may like them, you may not like them, but look at the connection. It just, it just struck me. And Picasso, he painted what he wanted. You like him, you don't like mm -hmm. him. It's, it's a very personal choice, and neither one is right or wrong. This is, we are all very, it's very personal, your love towards art your love to anything the way you look at life it's all different perspectives but we, there is no doubt that Picasso did change the art world there is no doubt he went and took the great masters he broke it down he looked at it from different ways the cubism and you know so they explored and they explored it fearlessly they did not sit there and say oh my god we just want to become a millionaire we're like no let's see what can we do with this and to tell the lie, the stories of such great artists and to see for me in costumes it's amazing now that I go back and I look at it how his life reflected on his clothes too you know like when he started went with Olga after his his period in the Basel Noir he was going around he was designing parade the ballet he was hanging out with Olga who was from the aristocracy so his clothes changed they became you know he started dressing up to fit into the whole rich influential world beautiful clothes beautifully tailored thing cufflings rings and then when he started becoming more and more famous in France he didn't he could wear you know stripes with bold color tops and you know all kinds of things because he did not need to adhere to the society so it's interesting how your success also can change your clothing so for um, I, I think I've gone off track but anyway there's it's also it's also part of the whole story you know we can learn so much from the because we get to see him from the start to the finish and in a long over 90 years so it's really quite interesting to see how a person develops you know and 
I love the fact that they come in and with the scripts in particular and there's so many other fantastic artists that come into yes. it and I love the fact that they've got Matisse and I love the fact that these poets and you know Apollinaire and these Max Jacobs and, and mm-hmm. you kind of you don't realise until you dive in like I, I knew a little bit about Picasso but I really did not know I forget how many of these scale. people were contemporaries yeah. and how much they were this was not an academic exercise they were engaged with the world and yeah. making this art uh Purposely and not sheepishly. Bravo, exactly. Yeah. That's well said. That's exactly right. Yeah. I loved uh, when the costume becomes, a, I think it's in the first episode, uh, when they first go to Paris, as uh, first or second episode, um, and they're getting their suits made, but they can't afford waistcoats. <laughs> and uh, there's a moment where the tailor shoots them a look of like, uh. yeah, I can make the jacket button up. <laughs> but you could tell that it's just like... <sighs> <laughs> um, and and I love the little the little choices that inform character um, because it's not about a suit it's about the fact that he at that moment actually cares what someone else seeing him thinks yeah uh, and then cut to the timeline of an older Picasso who shouldn't have to care what anyone thinks anymore but clearly he still does it's still a costume oh, he wants to look like a working man mm-hmm. in fact in one of the interviews I'd read where he had an Italian tailor making his clothes for him this mm-hmm. was later in the 50s and 60s uh, Michel uh, S- uh, Saponi I think had the name of the tailor his famous tailor and he would tell Michel he's like Michel he would say make me something that gets noticed but it might look absolutely nonchalant but it mm-hmm. was absolutely made to make an impact mm-hmm. yeah. I love that there's a repeating line throughout the show that he's just painting what he sees uh, which always struck me as, as funny because when most of us were first introduced to Picasso he looks so different than Renaissance painters uh, and looks so different than realism uh, that that I, I almost I grew up thinking the opposite about Picasso they can't be painting what he sees those paintings look insane yeah yes. um, but the, the show does a wonderful job of walking you towards what he means by that that, yes. that he could paint Renaissance paintings when he was six or when he was ten. Absolutely. This uh, is the he beauty of doing this. Yeah. This is the beauty of our writers. Yeah. That is why everything that you've said in the last few minutes just makes enhances how important the writing team is. Because Davina and I can do our hair, makeup, and costumes, which is very important. But the writing helps us. If it was written in the script that he didn't have a waistcoat, and that's why we did it. Mm-hmm. But that is why Ken Biller and his entire Raft Green and the entire team of the writers who are in LA they're amazing because they it's again boils down to teamwork each person is carrying their load the writer's doing the writing the best way they can she's doing the best hair and makeup design I'm doing mean, as, as good as was a job I can do with costume and each and that applies to everybody so I think yeah thank you for pointing that out but that, I just that goes a lot to the writers too also you know everybody like especially within my department um, you know I tell my team every day you know I give you a selection of colours but we all paint differently we all, we want to get to this end result, but we all paint differently. And the same when I was talking to Antonio right at the start. You know, I do all my research, he does his for the character. And then we, you know, we chat about what he sees and what I see and the difference. And then, you know, and then just building Picasso, we come together, you know, as a team and we kind of, you know, put everything together that, uh, that he sees and that I see. And then mm-hmm. we formulate, you know, Picasso together. And every day, uh, Antonio, which I love, every day Antonio would come up to me and would be on set and I'd be touching up something on his face. And he'll go, Davina, today you're painting a Picasso. And I love that. <laughs> I love that line. I love that. Oh, that's and, uh, you know, every single day he'd do something like that. Because every single day the colours would change. Mm-hmm. And like I say, from us being outside or inside and heat and freezing cold weather and so you know I'm always saying to my artists on the team you know I paint differently to anybody else and that's exactly what Picasso was doing he sees it differently to how I do it well on a show that has so many timelines uh, it it feels like you've built multiple thorough worlds they're they're believable to the back seams I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the show so far and the yeah. super Thank you so much. Really cool. That's wonderful. Really cool. I know the amount of work that goes into the writing can be great or bad, but yeah. the show doesn't look believable. Yeah, that's it. And Thank that's, you. That's, that's but, their job. Yeah, we have to be. Just, frankly, it is such a marvelous opportunity. Just, it's such a marvelous opportunity to bring to life these stories. And as designers, to do all these different decades in one show and not mm-hmm. different shows, we are really lucky. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. For your time.
The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast and a member of the Electric Sweater Podcast Network. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com and electricsweater.com. I'm Grant Davis. Thanks for listening. <laughs>